This is the seventh lecture on the waves topic. In this lecture, we're going to be looking at sound levels, the Doppler effect, and shock waves. This lecture covers textbook sections 17.4, 17.7, and 17.8. So first of all, a very quick recap of the most important points from last lecture. We showed that the equation of position relative to equilibrium for a particle which a sound wave was passing by is given by s of xt, that's the displacement from equilibrium, is equal to s max, the maximum displacement from equilibrium, cos kx minus omega t. The associated equation for a pressure is the change in pressure is equal to b, the bulk modulus, s max k sine kx minus omega t. Now it's important to note that one is a cos function and one is a sine function. So these two things are out of phase by 90 degrees or pi on 2 radians. When one is zero, the other is a maximum or a minimum and vice versa. We derive the expression for the velocity of sound in different mediums. Velocity of sound is equal to the square root of the bulk modulus over the density. And it's related to the temperature through the equation the velocity is equal to 331 times the square root of 1 plus the temperature in degrees Celsius over 273. We show that the relationship between maximum pressure difference and displacement is the change in pressure is equal to rho, the density, V, the velocity, omega, which is 2 pi F, S max. And then finally, we finished up by showing these power and intensity relationships. The average power delivered by a sound wave is given by a half rho, the density, v, the velocity, omega squared, a, this is the area, s squared max, the amplitude. So the intensity is equal to the average power over the area. Generally, as a sound wave travels through space, it travels at the same speed in all directions. So the surface area it ends up covering is in the shape of a sphere and so a is given by 4 pi r squared. Okay on to new material. Sound levels in decibels. The human ear can detect a very large range of intensities of sound from 10 to the minus 12 up to 1 watt per meter squared. We use a logarithmic to the base 10 scale to describe this large range. And so beta, which is the sound levels in decibels, is given by the expression 10 log i, the intensity, over i naught, the reference intensity. So in this equation, i is the intensity of sound in watts per meter squared. i naught is the reference intensity, which is the lowest sound the human ear can pick up, which is 1 times 10 to the minus 12 watts per meter squared. And beta is the sound level in decibels. To practice using this equation, you can try homework set 6 for Phys 1121, question 9, for Phys 1131, question 11. So to give you some idea about the kind of numbers we're dealing with, a nearby jet airplane is 150 decibels, jackhammer would be 130, a siren 120, and things which are very quiet, mosquito is around about 40, a whisper is 30, Rustling leaves are around 10. Here's a question to try. Two identical machines are positioned the same distance from a worker. The intensity of sound delivered by each operating machine at the worker's location is 2 times 10 to the minus 7 watts per meter squared. Find the sound level heard by the worker when one machine is working. B. Find the sound level heard by the worker when two machines are working. And C. How many machines would need to be operating to double the sound level heard in A? To answer this question, we're told that the intensity of one machine is 2.0 times 10 to the minus 7 watts per meter squared. So to find the sound level, all we need to do is substitute it into the expression. The sound level is equal to 10 log to the base 10 i over i naught, where i naught is the reference intensity. So this is 10 log to the base 10, 2 times 10 to the minus 7 over 10 to the minus 12. Solving that on the calculator, you end up with 53 decibels. Now, in part b, there's now two machines operating, so the intensity has been doubled. So all we need to do is double the intensity in this equation here. So we've got 10, to the, 10 log to the base 10 of 2 times 2 times 10 to the minus 7 
over 10 to the minus 12. So solving that on the calculator, we get 56 decibels. So even though we've doubled the intensity, we've only increased the sound level by 3 decibels. Now part C was how many machines would we need to double the sound level. So our new sound level is 106 and that's equal to 10 log to the base 10. Now if we have n machines, the intensity will be n times 2 times 10 to the minus 7 over 10 to the minus 12. Okay, so this we can say is 10.6 is equal to log to the base 10 of, let's cancel this out and that's 10 to the 5, so that's 2n times 10 to the 5. And then to get rid of the log, we can raise 10 to the power of both these things. And that gives us 10 to the 10.6 is equal to 2n times 10 to the power of 5. And so finally, solving that on the calculator, n is equal to 199,050. So this is how many machines we'd need to double the sound level. So this is just because of the logarithmic nature of this scale. This graph shows you the range of human hearing at different frequencies. So our ears actually pick up some frequencies better than other frequencies. So for example, we're not very good at hearing low frequencies. At low frequencies, we need quite a large intensity before we start to hear it. This, the white part on this graph shows the sounds that we can actually hear. Above this level here, the sound actually does damage to our eardrum, so we can detect it, but not safely. Dogs and some other animals can detect much higher frequency sounds than humans can. So one interesting thing with sound levels is that because it's all processed inside our heads, a change in sound level of around about 10 decibels corresponds to something which sounds to us like it's twice as loud. So that's just due to physiological reasons. There's not really a physical reason for that. So now we had a demonstration of the Doppler effect where we swung around an alarm and heard how the sound changed. Okay, now let's look at the maths involved. As an observer, our cyclist in this case is our observer, moves towards the source, the fire truck in this case is the source, the frequency f and wavelength lambda produced by the source do not change. However, the frequency f dash and the wavelength lambda dash do. So f dash and lambda dash are referring to the frequency and the wavelength observed by the cyclist here, by the observer. Now, the velocity of the sound observed by this observer is given by v dash is equal to v plus v naught. That's because she's traveling towards the sound, so to her it seems like the sound is going faster than it actually is. And so the sound's apparent velocity is V dash equal to V plus V naught. So now F dash, the observed frequency, is equal to V dash over lambda, where lambda is the wavelength produced by the source. So we've got V plus V naught on lambda, and now lambda, remember, is just equal to V on F. That's from V is equal to F lambda. So replacing lambda with V over F, we have F dash, the observed frequency, is equal to V plus V naught on V times F. And this was for the case where the observer was moving towards the source. Now if the observer is moving away from the source, then the velocity of the sound waves to her look like they're V minus V naught. And so this equation becomes F dash V minus V naught on V F. Okay, now let's imagine a slightly different case. Now the cyclist is stopped at the traffic lights and the fire truck, the source, is moving. Now in this case we're going to consider how this is going to change the wavelength that approaches. Now in this case we're going to imagine how the wavelength is changed for the observer. So the wavelength is discussed decreased as the wave fronts arrive with a shorter time interval between them. During each oscillation, the source moves a distance VST, where T is the period, which is VS on F. So this fire track emits a wave front and then it moves a distance VST before emitting another one. So those wave fronts have been compressed, they're closer together by this distance here. 
And so lambda dash, the new wavelength, the one observed by the observer, is equal to lambda minus delta lambda, which is lambda minus Vs on F. So F dash, the observed frequency, is the velocity over lambda dash, which is the velocity over lambda minus Vs on F. That's just from up here. And lambda is equal to V on F from V equals F lambda. And so moving the F out from here, we have F dash is equal to V over V minus Vs F. So in this case, the frequency is actually increasing as those wave fronts are closer together. Now, if the source moves away from the observer, then the wavelengths are stretched out and the frequency becomes F dash is equal to V over V plus Vs F. So what we can do now is combine these two situations, if both the observer and the source are moving, then the new frequency, F dash, that observed by the observer, is given by V plus V naught, where V naught is the velocity of the observer, over V minus V s, where V s is the velocity of the source, times the frequency produced by the source. Now, note that these signs are for when these two things are moving towards each other. If the observer was moving away from the source, then this would be a negative sign. If the source was moving away from the observer, then this would be a positive sign. To practice using this equation, for you should try homework set 6. For 1121 students, questions 14. For 1131 students, questions 17 and 19. Okay, here's a question for you to try. You stand on the platform at a train station and listen to the train approaching the station at a constant velocity. While the train approaches, but before it arrives, what do you hear? A. The intensity and the frequency of the sound both increasing. B. The intensity and the frequency of the sound both decreasing. C. The intensity increasing and the frequency decreasing. D. The intensity decreasing and the frequency increasing. E, the intensity increasing and the frequency remaining the same, or F, the intensity decreasing and the frequency remaining the same. Here's a hint. Have a very careful think about what the question's actually answer, asking. So the correct answer is E. The intensity is going to increase as the train is getting closer to you, and so you'll hear a louder and louder sound, but the frequency is going to remain the same as it's traveling at a constant velocity. So the frequency is going to be different, it will be higher than if the train was stationary, but while the train is travelling at that constant velocity, you will hear a constant higher frequency, so it actually remains constant as the train approaches. Here's a question. Your clock radio awakens you with a steady irritating frequency of 600 hertz. One morning it malfunctions and you cannot be turned off. In frustration, you drop the clock radio out of your fourth-story dorm window, 15 metres from the ground. Assume the speed of sound is 343 metres per second. As you listen to the falling clock radio, what frequency do you hear just before it strikes the ground? Okay, so in this question, here's you, you the observer, dropping your alarm clock out the dorm window. It is 15 Point zero meters above the ground. Now your velocity is not changing and you're the observer. The velocity of sound is 343. So to work out the change in frequency we're no going to need to know the velocity of the source just before it hits the ground. So to do that we'll need to use some of the mechanics equations. We can use V squared is equal to V naught squared plus 2A times the displacement. So in this case, it's in the y direction. So initially, the alarm clock has no velocity. So we're assuming you just drop it. You haven't thrown it towards the ground. So this is 2 times 9.8, which is the acceleration, times 15. If we take downwards as the negative direction, then this 15 is in the negative direction, and this 9.8 is also negative. So the negative signs will cancel each other out. And so the velocity squared is equal to... 294 and so the velocity of the source just before it hits the ground is 17.146 meters per second. Now if the source and the observer are moving towards each other the observed frequency is equal to V plus V naught over V minus Vs F. In this case the observer has no velocity 
and the source is actually moving away from our observer. So we're going to have to change this to a positive sign. And so f dash is equal to 343 over 343 plus 17.146 times the initial frequency, which was the 600 hertz. So solving that on the, your calculator, you end up with 571 hertz. So it's a lower frequency as the wave fronts are more spaced out when they hit you. Okay, another question. A submarine, sub A, travels through the water at constant speed of 8 meters per second, emitting a sonar wave at a frequency of 1,400 hertz. The speed of sound in water is 1,533 meters per second. The second submarine, sub B, is located such that both submarines are traveling directly towards each other. The other submarine is moving at 9 meters per second. A, what frequency is detected by an observer riding on sub B as the subs approach each other? And B, the subs barely miss each other and pass. What frequency is detected by an observer riding on sub B as the subs recede from each other? Okay, so in this question we have sub A, which is our source of the sound. It's moving with a speed of 8 meters per second towards sub B. Here's sub B, it's got an observer on it, and it's moving at a speed of 9 meters per second towards sub A. Now we're told that the velocity of sound in the water is 1,533 meters per second, and that the frequency of the sound emitted by sub A is equal to 1,400 hertz. So the observed frequency is given by the expression V plus V naught over V minus V S F. And in this case, we don't need to switch the signs because they're both moving towards each other. So this is equal to 1,533 plus 9 over 1,533 minus 8 times 1,400. Solving that on your calculator, you should get 1,416 hertz. Now in case B, sub B has moved past sub A, so they're both moving away from each other. So what we're going to need to do is switch these signs. So F dash will be V minus V naught over V plus V S F, 1533 minus V naught, which is the 9 over 1533 plus Vs, which is the 8, times 1,400. Solving that on the calculator, you should end up with 1,385 hertz. Okay, so onto shock waves. What happens if the velocity of the source exceeds the speed of sound in that medium? So as in this case here, where we've got a supersonic jet going at a speed Vs, which is faster than speed V. When this case, imagine that at S0 it emits a signal. Now after a time t, the signal has covered out to cover a sphere with a radius vt. Here we go, this line's perpendicular. In that same interval t, the aircraft has moved a distance vst, so it's moved ahead of this wave front here. Now if we draw a whole lot of little wave fronts for the different increments, what we end up getting is actually a cone shaped like this. And the angle of the cone here, this is 90 degrees up here because it's where the radius meets the tangent to the circle. So along this axis we have a distance Vst, along this axis we have Vt, and so sine theta is opposite over hypotenuse, which is V over Vs. So that's what we have over here, sine theta is equal to V over Vs. Now, the inverse of this, Vs on V, is known as the Mach number. And these conical wave fronts are called shock waves. Now, you've probably seen shock waves before on fast boats. Fast boats, we're considering the water waves rather than the sound waves. But the boat can often travel faster than the speed at which the water waves can travel through the water. So, for fast boats, we end up with this shock wave as well. And here's the shock wave of a bullet. So bullets do create sound shock waves as well because they will go faster than the speed of sound in the medium. 
So here's a question. An aeroplane flying with a constant velocity moves from a cold air mass into a warm air mass. Does the Mach number increase, decrease or stay the same? Well, as it goes into the warm air mass, because the density is decreasing, the speed of sound is increasing. So the speed of sound in that medium increases. So going back to our equation for Mach number, Vs on V, Vs, the velocity of the source is staying the same, but V is increasing. So since V is on the bottom, that means that our Mach number must be decreasing. So B, decreasing, is the correct answer. Okay, and finally some questions to try. A supersonic jet travelling at Mach 3 at an altitude H of 20,000 metres is directly over a person at T equals naught. Assume that the average speed of the sound in air is 335 metres per second over the path of sound. Part A, at what time will the person encounter the shock wave due to the sound emitted at time T equals naught? And part B, where will the plane be when this shock wave is heard? Okay, this diagram is very helpful for answering the question. The person's going to hear the shock wave when they're effectively in that conical wave front. And so what we need to do is work out when will the plane be at this place here such that the person hears this boom. Okay, so let's answer this question. What we want to know is the time and then part B is asking us the dis the, where will the plan be, so we need this distance x. Okay, well we know that sine theta is equal to 1 over the Mach number, which is equal to 1 over 3. So we can use this to work out theta. Theta is equal to 19.47 degrees. That's the inverse sine of this. Okay, now this is our angle theta here. 19.47 degrees. So tan theta is equal to opposite over adjacent, which is h over x. Now h is a known number and theta is known, so we can use this to work out x. x is equal to 20,000 over tan of 19.47, which is equal to 56,569 meters. So this distance this is the distance that the plane has traveled in that time. Now we can use this distance to work out the time because we know how fast the plane's going. It's going at three times the speed of sound. Now we were told that we could assume that the speed of sound in this case was equal to 335 meters per second. So this tells us how fast the plane is going. The velocity of the plane is equal to three times this. So three times 335 meters per second. So if we want to work out how long it's taken to travel the distance x, we can just use time is equal to distance over speed. So that's 56,569 metres over 3 times 335. And solving that on the calculator, we end up with 56.3 seconds. So that's the distance the plane has travelled. Now, in regards to part B, it's still at the altitude of 20,000 metres and it has travelled 56 Point six kilometers um, horizontally. Okay, and the final question. A bat moving at 5 meters per second is chasing a flying insect. If the bat emits a 40 kilohertz chirp and receives back an echo at 40.4 kilohertz, what is the speed of the insect? And B, will the bat be able to catch the insect? Explain. Okay, so in this question we have a bat. He is travelling at 5 metres per second. And we have some flying insect here travelling at, let's call it V insect. Now, he emits a, the bat emits a pulse with a frequency of 40 kilohertz and then receives a signal back with a frequency of 40.4 kilohertz. Should be a point zero. Now, this question is actually a bit harder than it looks. We're going to need to solve it in two parts. First of all, we'll need to consider what's the frequency of the sound reflected off the insect, and then we'll need to consider that reflected pulse and work out what frequency is then detected back by the bat. Okay, so the frequency of the reflected pulse 
In this case, our bat is acting as our source and our insect is acting as our observer. So we have got the velocity is 343. Our observer is moving away from our source. So we have minus V insect. And now our bat, our source is moving towards our observer. So this is minus the velocity of the bat times the frequency. And this is the frequency emitted by the source. So that's the reflected wave. So now we consider this reflected wave as our source and work out what's the bat actually going to hear. So in that case, F dash will be, okay, so we've got 343. Now in this case, our bat is our observer and it is moving towards the reflective wave. So we'll have a plus the velocity of the bat. And the insect is the source of the reflective wave. So it's 343. Now, in this case, the insect, the source of the reflected sound is moving away from the bat. And so instead of having a negative here, we end up with a positive. So V insect here. Okay, and that's times the reflected. This is the Doppler equation on the reflected pulse. So now what we can do is we can substitute in this expression into here. And we end up with 343 plus V bat, which is the 5, over 343 plus V insect over 343 minus the velocity of the insect over 343 minus the velocity of the bat times f which is the 40.0 kilohertz and that is equal to 40.4 kilohertz so now we have an equation which is a little bit difficult to solve, but there's only one unknown, the velocity of the insect in this equation, so it's perfectly possible. So dividing this 40.4 by the 40 and solving for 343 plus 5 over 343 minus 5, we end up with 1.01 .01 is equal to 1.02958 times the 343 minus the velocity of the insect over 343 plus the velocity of the insect. And then just rearranging this and moving all the terms with the velocity insect over to one side, we end up with the velocity of the insect is equal to 3.31 meters per second. I'll leave that algebra as a little task for you to try. And so that is the velocity of this insect. Now part B asked us, is, it, is the bat going to catch the insect? Well, the bat's going at five meters per second towards the insect who's running away from it. And he is gaining on the insect. So yes, he will eventually catch the insect. Okay, and that's the end of this lecture.